my science talk for today, okay? About nanoscience. I am going to show you a series of pictures, okay? And see how much we know. It's basically it's like the power of 10. 10 to the zero is how many meters? Huh? Anyone know the answer? One. Okay. That was easy, right? I have three more. Now that generates some interest. So one meter. Do we know what we're looking at in here? Not quite. Okay, so let's, let's zoom in. Oh, now we're looking at leaves. Now we're looking at 10 to minus one, so it's a 10 centimeter. So we're zooming in a factor of 10. Now we can see the leaves. Beforehand, we cannot, okay? Let's zoom in one more. A factor of 10. Now it's one centimeter. Now we can see, you know, the wind, the, the wings, and all the other, like, maybe cell structure, okay? Let's zoom in closer. One millimeter. What can we see? Okay, maybe this is the, the you know, the cell, plant cell, okay. How about even smaller? 100 micron. 100 micron is like what? Micron is like times 10 to the minus 6. So now we can actually see slightly more clearly, you know, the plant structure of the plant cell. You can see the cell wall and all the other stuff. Zoom. Now let's get in 10 micron. Now what can we see? We start to see the individual cell. Even smaller. Now we're down to one micron. Now one micron. Now we can see, okay, the nucleus of the cell. I don't know if you guys seen the nucleus of the cell before. Now this is what it looks like. Okay, we start from what? One meter. From the leaves, okay, now we're zooming in, zooming in. So after one micron, now we go into even smaller. Now we start seeing what the chromosome. How it looks. Down to the nanometers, yeah? Because we're talking about nano science. It has to be nano, okay? Now let's look at even smaller, 100 angstrom. So now we're talking about what, 10 nanometer scale. 10 nanometer scale, so now what we're we seeing? Now we're seeing the double strand DNA. We can see it pretty clearly, what it's look like. And now if we're talking about the nanometers, which is here, 10 angstrom is one nanometer. Now you can actually see all this, you know, atom, the building block. So we just look at, starting from the leaves, we zoom in all the way to nanometer. And to recap, a nanometer is really small. Really, really small, okay? If you want to compare about the strength of the DNA, the width is about two to three nanometer, you know, the width, okay? So this is how small we're looking at, okay? If you're talking about, you know, the red blood cell, relatively speaking, it's huge because Red blood cell is about two to five micron times ten to the minus six. So, just give you a sense of one nanometer is actually one billionth of a meter. Okay, so this is what we're talking about, and this is my talk is going to be focusing on today. So now my talk, instead of just telling you the nano science more explicitly, I'm just actually telling you the Lotus effect. Okay, in the eyes of an ancient Chinese philosopher. Okay, I use really briefly. How the heck would that happen? And my name is Benny. If you don't remember, I'm gonna reintroduce you again. My name is Benny, okay? So you see all these pretty pictures and poems and Chinese and all this other stuff. How is that way to nanoscience, all this stuff? Then we're gonna find out. Well. Let's start from the beginning, okay? Because it's from the ancient Chinese philosophy. Let's answer that part of the question. We start from the literature, okay? Okay, if I mispronounce all this Chinese word, please bear with me, okay? Because it's not really my strongest language. Okay. What does that mean, right? I mean, this is easier, okay? Basically, I love only the lotus for growing in the mud, but it's not stained, okay? Bath by clear wave, but it's not seductive. 
and this is basically from Zhu Dunyi. Okay, this is look at this period of time. You know, 1017 to 1073. We're in what 2014, right? It's about what almost a thousand years ago, roughly 900 some years ago, and who know when he start ruling this, you can say poetry or literature, it could lead into nanotechnology. Okay, in fact, I think by reading this article, I think he is actually a nanotechnology scientist, a visionary nanotechnology scientist. Think about scientists, what, what, kind of in, what kind of characteristic do we need in terms of scientists? We need someone that observes, right? Make some hypothesis, try to guess what, you know, what all this data mean. And I'm using scientists here in a really loose sense because I put a quotation because I think he actually made observation. He noticed that, you know, even though the growing environment for the lotus leaf and all the lotus flower, they're in the mud, in the palm, but they're always clean. They're always clean. How does that work? He doesn't know at that time. A thousand years ago, he doesn't know. But he made that observation, and now we know the science behind it. And virtually, we use it in terms of a lot of application that I'm going to show you in about 20 to 30 minutes. Okay? So how do they clean themselves? Do you guys know about this? Because if you know, then don't tell your classmate, because otherwise it will be really boring. Don't steal all my thunder. Okay, do you guys know? Hopefully not, that's why you're here listening to my talk. Look at how nicely that droplet is. Okay, this is the question we'll answer. How do they clean themselves? Do they have someone, you know, wake up early in the morning before you walk into the pond and then, you know, someone clean it? Do you think the gardener clean every single lotus leaf before you, you visit the park? Most likely not. Okay, how do they sell cleaning? I mean, we can clean, our, clean ourselves, right? I mean, we go to the shower, you know, we can clean ourselves. But they're plants. They don't have arms. They have leaves. They don't move. How do they clean themselves? I mean, clearly, you know, you can see the water droplet, you know, you can, they trap some dirt in it. Okay. And then they actually pick up by the water droplet. Okay, this is how they clean themselves. But how is the chemistry behind it? Making sense, and how can we make this from this observation? He made that observation. He wrote the literature, and now at the, almost a thousand years later, it become a really revolutionary technology. Okay. Now, then I have to introduce you. What does that mean by surface wet purity? Okay, this is important. Really loosely speaking, I try to avoid most of the the equation, numbers, and all this other stuff. I'm just trying to do more qualitative thinking. You're basically just looking at. If I add a drop of water on the surface, is it going to spread out? Or is it going to just make a little beat? Okay, spherical droplet on the surface. Okay, if something is, if we say something is a really wet surface, that means if I add a drop of water, it will just spread out, covering the surface. Okay, really simple concept. This is the only thing I want you to know from this slide. Okay, if something that forms like a really cool droplet, like the last picture, we say that is not a really wet surface. Okay, this is the only concept that I want you to know. Okay, spread or be dumped. Okay, that's what we want to think about at the moment. Now, how do we classify them? Now we jump into a little mathematics a little bit. Now we introduce another new concept called the contact angle. Now, contact angle is basically this angle. Basically, it's between all the three faces boundary between the liquid gas and solid. Okay, so we have a liquid droplet here, we have the air and the solid surface. So basically this is the angle we're talking about. So if I add a drop of water on any surface, I should be able to, with a protractor, I can measure the contact angle. Maybe you need a magnified glasses, but you just need a protractor, you can measure that. That's not nanotechnology, right? This is like something we can just do it back in what, form one or form two, or maybe even you know elementary school. Okay, so now, if the angle that we're talking about, this contact angle, is less than 90 degrees, that means they're really flat, they spread out, we call it hydrophilic surface. They love water, hydrophilic. If it's something greater than 90 degrees, then now we call them the hydrophobic surface. They don't like water, so they want to beat up. Okay, so the, the angle, the degree will be greater than 90 degrees. Okay. 
But that's not good enough. That's not enough to do what the Luther's list have been doing all these years. Actually, we have something called the super hydrophobicity surface, which is when the contact angle is greater than 150 degrees. That is something called a super hydrophobic surface, and that's pretty much what happened. You see the water droplet, they just form a little bit, and then they're ready to roll off and clean themselves. Okay? And we call this the Lutus effect. Okay? This is from that literature inspired, from my perspective, lead to the technology, and now we're going to try to get into the technology part. Okay? Pretty cool. Now, what causes the water droplet to you know, spread out or form a bead? Basically, we will look into something called the surface tension. Okay, you may have learned about surface tension, but if you don't remember, then let's take a really quick look. Basically, it's just the energy. I like to think about the surface energy. How much energy are we talking about? Okay, now, required to increase the surface area of the liquid that we have. Okay. Complicated, doesn't make much sense, but that's okay. We now let look at the next picture. Now, the surface tension you're thinking about is the cohesive force. Okay. If you look at the in the bulk of the liquid, let's say in water in here, I have this water molecule that's surrounded by other six other water molecules, then all the intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding, all the forces that you have learned from your chemistry class, then they look pretty balanced. Right? Everything is balanced. They're happy. Okay. When the water molecules are happy, that means that at the lowest energy state, then they're happy, they're stable. Now, but for the water molecule on the water surface or near the water surface, then guess what happened? They're missing the other labor water molecules. So it's not balanced. The forces they have experienced are not balanced. Then what happened when the forces are not balanced? Then the net force is basically driving it to curve. As you may have seen in here, okay. So if I have to, I drop the little chopper. I add some, you know, food color dye in here. You see the water surface. Basically, it's more than the cup can handle, but it does not overfill. In fact, I can possibly add more, more, and more. You may time sooner but you're welcome to look at it afterward but if I put a little white paper behind you can see the height of the water is actually above the cup those are the surface tension that we're talking about okay we are talking about this you put experience that before we just put it together it's called the surface tension okay so we have this that's not that exciting okay exciting stuff come later Paperclip challenge, okay, so I have a bunch of paper clips in here and I would love to ask for volunteer if you can try to put the paper clip on the in the water, but the paper clip has to float. And for participant, please grab the chocolate. Okay. Anyone wanna try? Okay, come on in. Okay, what's, what's your name? What's your name? Uh, Ken. Ken? Nice to meet you. You know, just like a magic show, right? We have to have a third party examine the paper clip. It's not something weird. Your show. Oh, no, you can do the, this one. This one is fine. Okay. Yeah. Try your best. Hopefully, it works. That's not easy. Then keep trying again. You can, have, you can have three trials. It's the paper clip challenge. Oh, yes. Whoa. That's good. Which, you, which one would you like to have? Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone want to try? Please come on in. It 
happens, just like science, right? Not every experiment will work, but that's all part of the practice, trial and error. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So what happened is that the surface of the water is just like a little elastic. And when this happened, basically the pair clip just caused a little bit of indentation and you can float. Even though we know that the density of the paper clip is heavier than the water. But because of the surface tension effect, we can try to levitate and make something float. I lie, I tried to say I don't have that many equations, but I did lie to you guys, okay? So now, beforehand, we just talk about the surface tension basically in the liquid and with liquid and air. Basically, now let me be more specific to define what a surface is. Basically, a surface can be any interface between faces. For example, now if you look at this, the contact angle basically is the equilibrium angle. Okay? When all the forces in the x-direction are balanced. Beforehand, we talk about, you know, we have this interface between the liquid and the solids. Okay, this is this one interface, there's some force involved, the surface tension. There's surface tension between the solid and the air, and also the surface tension between the liquid and the air. So we're actually having three surface tension, and each of them have force, okay? And the forces you can write in terms of this equation, because they're all balanced from your physics class, okay? And basically, we can rearrange the equation, and you get something called the Yang relation. Okay, so if you don't remember any of this stuff, it's okay at this moment, at least you understand we try to look at the equilibrium angle. The contact angle is an equilibrium angle, something that's stable, it's not going to change. And basically when that happens, all the forces in the x-direction, they're balanced. This is as much I want you to get at this moment. And if you want to remember, then it's called something called the Yang relation. Because if you're interested in it, you can just go to Google, you type Yang relation, look it up from Wikipedia, you get those equations back out again. Okay. Now, what makes those surfaces attract or repel? Okay, we talk about, you know, we have the surface tension, but it's still not that really concrete. What can you do? So basically, it's the surface chemistry and the surface roughness. Those are the two factors that make the surfaces, sometimes they'll attract the water or sometimes they'll repel the water. So there are two factors that you need to think about. Surface chemistry and the surface roughness. The surface chemistry, you can think of it this way, okay? If I have a, a glass slide, one without any oil coating, glass is basically made of SiO2, silica. The O2, or uh, SiOH, SiOH. So basically they have a, they have a hydroxyl group sticking out on the glass. And remember, water molecules H2O, basically you have all this like, hydrogen bonding, all this lovely interaction that you can think about. But if you coat the glass slide with a layer of oil, then now you have make it hydrophobic surfaces because you, have, you don't have the same interaction intermolecular forces. In here you have hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole interaction, van der Waals forces, okay, basically it's the light the soft light principle. In terms of the surface chemistry, you can think about, you know, the, if the liquid and the surface have similar properties, similar functional groups, similar intermolecular forces, then they like to attract each other, okay. And when that happens, you know, the glass slide that we talk about, we will call this like really high energy. And it's hydro hydrophilic, okay? Because if you think about the surface like glass or metal, the bonding between them, basically they have a really strong interaction among themselves. The strong enough that they can overcome the hydrogen bonding, then they attract the water molecule, then they spread out, okay? Unlike here, oil basically is just a bunch of like hydrocarbon chain, okay? So that make it hydroph hydrophobic and you have this repulsion. So basically we're looking at in terms of the adhesion force between the interface versus the cohesive force within the liquid droplet. Okay, wherever one's larger, that will be the answer for that. But that is not what the lutus leaf is about. The lutus leaf is not about surface chemistry. The lutus leaf effect, or the lutus effect basically coming from the surface roughness, okay? So if I have a really smooth hydrophobic surface, it may look like an angle like this, but it's not gonna give me the super hydrophobic surface that I'm talking about. So what do I need to do? I need to introduce some sort of nanoscale roughness. Really, really small thing like this, then in the nanoscale, 
at the beginning of the show that we show you guys, you know, in that kind of scale. Now, in this case, if I have some nanoscale roughness, the water droplet actually just sit on top of this, you know, nano pillar. Okay, it doesn't sit on the smooth surface. In effect, the contact angle now you're looking at will be greater than 150 degrees. Why? Because by building this nanostructure in here, nanoscale structure, I'm essentially trapping air. Air is actually hydrophobic. Now you have this hydrophobic air, you know, substance sitting at the bottom. Now basically the water will just sit on top. Okay, they just don't like to get close to each other. Let's go back to the lotus leaf. How do they clean themselves? This is the question. The nanoscale roughness, nano roughness. If you look at an SEM image, a scanning electron microscope, something that's stronger than your typical, you know, light microscope that you have. Basically, you see this nanoscale pillar. Look at the scale bar. This is like 30 microns. So this is the scale bar, but this is a lot smaller than the 30 micron in here. Okay. They actually, if you look under those lotus leaf in an electron microscope, they have those little nano pillar right there. Okay. You don't know. I mean, you look at the leaves, it just look normal. But if you actually zoom in, that should look like this. And if you put it another factor of 10 smaller in a three micron scale, you see they're not smooth. It may appear it's smooth when you touch it, but in fact, they're not. And this nano roughness is, is the part that they trap all this air molecules and make it super hydrophobicity. Okay. And if you look into this, basically, well, this is what happened. They have the little um, epidermal cell microstructure. This is what you're looking at in here. And on top of those micropillar structures, they have all this little wax crystal. Wax is a hydrocarbon. They're hydrophobic. Now you add the little water molecule. They just sit on top. And then at a really small angle, we're talking about a two or three degree. The water droplet is ready to roll off. And along with that, all the little dust particle or the dust particle, they'll stack it inside the water droplet and just clean themselves. This is basically how it works. Okay, it's the nanoscale roughness in the lotus leaf structure that gives this self cleaning properties. And that's why I say at the beginning, the Chinese philosopher, he observed this, but that he may not have the science background to explain this. But almost a thousand years later, now we know how to explain this. And I think this is an interesting interdisciplinary between the Chinese literature and the nanotechnology and nanoscience in here.